and welcome to another episode of Sporting Directions, proudly sponsored by Tsunami Teamwear, with myself, Simon Atkinson. And me, Gavin Taylor. Hello, everybody. For those of you who are new to the show and new to Sporting Directions, this podcast is aimed at providing some ideas and some guidance for those of you wanting to pursue a career in the world of sport. Over the course of this first series, we'll be interviewing a range of professionals from different areas of sport. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sporting Directions, proudly sponsored by Tsunami Teamwear, with me, Simon Atkinson. And me, Gavin Taylor. Hello, everybody. For those of you who are new to the show and new to the podcast, we are aiming to give ideas and guidance to anyone else out there hoping to achieve a career in the world of sport. Over the course of this first series, we'll be interviewing a range of professionals from different areas of sport, having them share with us their amazing stories, their struggles, their achievements, and any advice they might have for others wanting to also pursue a career in this wonderful industry of sport. Now, today, we are happy to welcome Rebecca moore Chakovsky. Now, Rebecca is a cross-campus head of gymnastics at Bangkok Patna School and has a very rich background as a PE, dance, gymnastics, and well-being teacher over many, many years. Rebecca, welcome. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Now, a really good start to this conversation would be to know a little bit more about what it is you actually do as a head of gymnastics at one of the top schools in Asia for sport. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is my first year at Patino. I made the move from Switzerland and I made the move from PE teaching. And before Switzerland, I was in the Netherlands and I did PE teaching and gymnastics. Yeah, the job came up at Bangkok Patina for a head of cross campus gymnastics. So my day-to-day -day life, I will go in and we'll start to look at admin side of the program. So I'm responsible for all the budgets, the marketing, um, the staffing, and all of the things that kind of fall under my gymnastic umbrella. And then it all kicks off at 2.30 after school. We've got over 400 ECAs at Patina. It's crazy good, like the ECA program. We've got year one and twos in our development gym and they come for ECA. And then we have year three plus team competitive gymnastics, which will come and train. And then we have our recreational gymnastics who will also come and train at 2.30. And they train for two to three hours, depending on their ability and their choice. And yeah, that's kind of my what my day-to-day -day looks like. That sounds amazing. I can only imagine how many uh, gymnasts you would have bouncing around and, and jumping around and things like that. So um, just start us, start us off a little bit with how did you get into gymnastics from a from a certain early age or teenage years, perhaps? Yeah, so I can't actually remember life before gym. So my parents used to tell me that I'd jump off everything and hang off everything. So they took me to soft play, I think, when I was two. And then I joined the competitive team when I was four. And then I've just been a gymnast my entire life. So, or involved in gymnastics my whole life. So I was competing in gymnastics till around about the time I GCSEs. And I basically trained all the time and loved it. And unfortunately I had an injury. My, me and my teammate were like playing at lunchtime at school and I ended up breaking my foot right before a really big competition. And yeah, I just decided actually that I wanted to explore other things because gymnastics is very intense, as you probably know, in terms of training commitment, the hours. It's a lot more than a lot of other sports. You need to train five times a week competing, which will take your entire weekend. So it was, it was a lot. And I had my GCSEs coming up. So yeah, I decided to take a step back from gym and I thought that would be it. I thought, you know, okay, it's been a great period of my life but I'm ready to leave it behind and floor was my strongest apparatus and um, part of that was my dance ability and in school I don't know if you had this where you guys grew up but we had rock challenge in Yorkshire so I, in year seven I remember I got involved in rock challenge and fell in love with dance as its own entity I always had dance training as part of gymnastics but then to have it separately I loved it so I decided to transition, uh, I think at 14, I started taking proper dance lessons like tap, ballet, modern, jazz. And so I was a very late starter coming into the dance world. So yeah, and then at 16, when I went to sixth form, I just had this missing feeling inside. You know, I'd stepped away from gym for just over a year, I think, maybe a year and a half. And I just knew I had to go back. Like I was missing it. It was like a hole in my 
<laughs> in my core. Um, so I went back to my local gym and I just volunteered coaching and I volunteered for about a year and my coach put me through my level one. She was like, if you like it, great. If you don't, you know, no worries. And absolutely fell in love with coaching. Yeah, I kind of, I met my GCSE dance teacher as well. So I already knew she was like a huge inspiration for me. And I already knew that teaching was going to be my future. Like very young, I knew I needed to be a teacher. It was like a calling, I guess. I, I just felt it. Um, and then coaching as well, just kind of was there. So I had these two options, teaching in schools and coaching gymnastics. Throughout my A-levels, I was coaching and increased my hours of coaching as well, increased which classes I took. So from recreation, I went up to the development squad and I was really drawn between, um, like torn, sorry, between dance and PE because I had these skill sets because as well in school growing up, I was always part of like the athletics competition, played netball for my school. So I was very, very sporty, not as sporty in teams as I've liked. So I didn't really have the time because I was always at gym, but I'd always represent my school. So I love sport and I love dance. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And then I decided to take a gap year and my school didn't allow me to do PE and dance at the same time for A-level because it wasn't in the blocks. So I chose dance. And then I was like, I don't know if that's right. So in my gap year, I went to college and I did BTEC in sport so that I had that A-level style option to give me a better kind of, I guess, more information to make that decision for what I want to do at university. Do I want to go down sport? Do I want to go down dance? And within that gap year, I then did my level two gymnastics coaching two and level one, two and three cheerleading coaching and started working for the local council who had subcontracted my gym to do sport community outreach. So I'd go into the local secondary schools in the area and do after school clubs for these kids Yeah, in, in gymnastics and, and cheerleading. So that was kind of my journey up until university and then I had a big decision to to make. Awesome. It's really good to hear the different stages that you took. And I wanted to kind of dig a little bit more into the into the passion for gymnastics in terms of where you, you've got to today. Obviously, it's great that you've been able to dip into other areas. And obviously, dance is very much linked to gymnastics. I know there's a clear difference, but they obviously do go quite hand in hand. So just tell us that kind of, or spend a bit more time telling about that eureka moment, right? So you said to us, you, you did your level one and you absolutely loved it. And you fell in love with, you know, obviously you love gymnastics from a personal point of view, but you fell in love with coaching. Yeah. And then you did your level two and you did obviously a bit of cheerleading. And obviously that's sort of linked to, to dance and gymnastics as well. And then you went off and did some volunteer hours in the community and then tried to give it a little bit back. So just talk us through that little bit of a, a, that eureka moment when you realised okay, being a gymnastics coach is the career for me. Um, and if you can then tell us a little bit about when you found that eureka moment, what did you, when did you go, okay, what is my eureka moment and how am I going to turn this feeling into a career? I always knew I loved it, but I was very headstrong as a kid and I just knew I wanted to be a teacher. So I actually had it a bit later, I guess, or I guess it just kept coming out. And at first I didn't recognize it. And then I had it a bit later. So I went to university and, and did my degree because I knew the route I had to take to become a school teacher. So yeah, I went and did my degree and then I went and did my PGCE. During my degree, I still missed it. So I volunteered down at a local club and was still like keeping my hand involved in it. I basically, after I finished my PGCE, I did a maternity cover PE and dance teaching. And I straight away got my job in the Netherlands. And actually it was, I, I didn't actually mean to get that job. Oh, like when I saw the job advertised on TES, I didn't recognize straight away that it was an international post. I just typed in PE and dance at the top. And then it was like, oh, the British School in the Netherlands, specialism, PE with specialism in dance and gym. And I was like, well, it sounds perfect. And I'd never actually considered international teaching. So I took that job, which was incredible, like an incredible school, an incredible place to live. And it really kind of opened my eyes. But the gymnastics and dance that I was responsible for was more curriculum for PE. And there was already a long-standing head of gym at the school 
And they actually wanted me to run the COVID Games program, which I did for two years, uh, which is athletic swimming and football. And we went to like Dubai college and stuff, these big sporting events. It was incredible. But I was like, oh God, I just, I miss gym. So I like begged my head of sport. I was like, can I please volunteer and go coach gyms as well as the COVID Games? He was like, well, you're going to be really busy. I was like, it's okay, I'll do it. Like, I'm fine to do it. So we started volunteering, coaching gym again. And yeah, I just, it, that was my moment, I guess. Being involved at the BSN in the gym program, it, it just made it really clear for me. So then I, I volunteered for two years as part of the gym program and kind of became part of the family. The guy who set up the gym program ran it for 38 years and he is a legend in the BSN. We all love him. He retired and they kind of appointed me as the next cross-campus head of gymnastics. So that was a big responsibility taking on a 38-year legacy. But yeah, we were very close. He was like my gymnastics father. And yeah, so then I ran the program at BSN as well as being a full-time PE teacher for three years. And then, yeah, decided to move to Switzerland, which is another, I guess, twist and turn. Because when I moved to Switzerland, I thought, okay, you know, this is a lot to be a full-time PE teacher, to do gymnastics several nights a week and weekends, you know, plus GCSE and all the other stuff that comes with teaching. I was like, maybe I should just focus on being a PE teacher uh, for a little bit and see how I feel. I really wanted to get IB experience because I'd only been in the British system. So I moved to an IB school to teach PEHE and well-being. Then this job at Patsana came up and I was just like, I just knew it in my gut. I was like, I, I just want to be back in gym. It's like my lifelong passion is the only thing in my life which I just cannot seem to leave behind. Total first love. So yeah, I went for it and here I am. So Thank you, Rebecca. That is a that is a really inspiring story, actually. It's one that very much focuses on just following your love, I think, uh, following your passion. <clears throat> One thing I picked up on was uh, you, you made a comment that there was a hole in my uh, a hole a hole in my core, a hole in my core, and I, I think that's a really powerful way of, of really putting forward that someone like you, someone like me, someone like Gavin, we have sport in our soul, you know, um, and, and without that, we do feel empty, um, and. That is, I think, really important for anyone wanting to get into this industry. Uh, there are going to be lots of ups, but there's also going to be a, an awful lot of downs. And, um, and there's going to be a lot of challenges. And, and as, as you put forward perfectly, um, if you've got that hole in your core, you know, what, what's, what's the point? You, we, need to, we need to be whole. Uh, and I think um, you've done a fantastic job in your career at, at filling that hole. But for anyone listening... And anyone wanting to watch this video or, or listening to this podcast backwards, I challenge anyone to, to count the amount of times, Rebecca, that you've mentioned the word volunteering. Yeah. And I've, I've written it down numerous times. And you're absolutely right. This industry is all about opportunity, taking your opportunities when they arise. And that's something you've done fantastically well. But those opportunities only really come with being in the right place at the right time. And volunteering is a great way of increasing your chances of being in the right place at the right time. And it, and it sounds like it worked fantastically well for you. So what I want to pick up on is there, is there, was there any particular moment in your career you think, wow, I was just in the right place at the right time and I knew the right people. Was there any particular moment in your, in your career or in your life you could say that, that, was, that was the moment where volunteering which is really important in this industry. Volunteering was the reason I've been able to go and become who I am today. Absolutely. I mean, volunteering at 16 at my club, you know, they always knew me as a gymnast. But just because you're a good athlete, it doesn't necessarily translate into being a good coach. So volunteering gave myself the opportunity to explore that. And then also my men, my future mentors who were going to sign me off as a coach, it gave them a chance to be able to see me as a coach in a different light. The opportunities that you get volunteering, you, you get to see whether you, sometimes you think you love something or you think that you're passionate about something, but until you do it, you don't know. And you're never always going to get these like opportunities to do it in a paid position. So putting yourself out there, 
taking a gamble and just showing up and working hard, you know, it's, I think for me, it paid off massively because if I didn't volunteer as well at the BSN, you know, I wouldn't have got the job because they wouldn't have known about that gymnastic passion. But they worked with me for two years and saw it and were very happy to then pass the baton on to me. So, yeah, volunteer, volunteer, volunteer all the way. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I did I did 10 years volunteering on the side of a rugby field. So uh, uh, no money, but shivering cold, soaking wet. But as you, as you put forward, volunteer, 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 meet the right people, but more importantly, give back as people have given to us in, in our childhood. A moment ago, we spoke about there being a lot of highs, there being a lot of lows. We've spoken about a lot of the highs and, and, and your accomplishments. But I think what's really important to also highlight or try and put forward to our listeners is has there been any barriers or any kind of ultimate failures, for example, that you believe were important to have experienced and, and what, you, what you've got from those uh, barriers or those failures or those uh, mistakes that helped you move forward in a positive way? For me, always kind of twisting and turning between the dance route and PE route and, and putting gymnastics within that PE bracket. Um, you know, it, it comes with, I guess, a lot of sometimes self-doubt. Am I changing my mind too much? Did I make the right decision? Should I have gone down only one route? So um, I, I think for me, I followed my gut. So when I went down a PE route and I did make the jump to maybe dance or something, that was, I made that jump for a reason. So sometimes I think it's easy for people to compare their journey to other people's. You know, I, I remember when I first started at the BSN, I compared my journey to PE purists in a way that hadn't twisted and turned. And I felt, I guess, a bit insecure about my background not being as strong in games. You know, I was teaching the whole curriculum and f football, rugby, hockey. Of course, that's part of my job as a PE teacher. But for me as a dance and gym specialist, you know, it was, it was very easy, when, especially being an NQT, to compare myself to these established, strong game specialist PE teachers and feel less than. That, that was a hurdle that I had to cut, overcome in, um, in the beginning of my career for sure. And I guess just reiterating to myself that I followed my gut and I followed my passion and being able to teach my passion is absolutely going to make me a better teacher because it's infectious, right? When someone's passionate about what they do and you're teaching that, those kids are lapping it up and they just, they feel that you live and breathe what you're saying. And I know for a fact, I wouldn't be able to do that about hockey. Like if I was running a hockey program coaching, I wouldn't have that passion like I do for gym and dance. So that kind of gave me that understanding. I love teaching PE, but I really live for gymnastics and dance. After a few years of those kind of wiggles and like uh, wobbles, I was like, okay, I've got clearer direction. I want to get back into gymnastics. And yeah, it gave me the great direction to then apply for the job at Passman. I really uh, just want to say it takes a lot of um, courage to, to be honest with that. And you talked a lot there about having self-doubt. Um, and you've obviously now shared that with with the world, if you like, in terms of the podcast and, and the fact that you felt insecure and I think even as a as a purist PE teacher, and, and I know Simon as well, is you're always comparing yourself to others. But in, obviously, as an NQT and things, but I think it's that kind of reminded me there. You think, well, actually, for someone like yourself, where you're comparing yourself to others because your journey's different, but you're also in your mind thinking, is this the right journey at all? That must have also had a kind of a double a double take. I like your phrase of it's infectious. You know, your passion's infectious. So. I just kind of want to talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, because obviously that that clearly is a, is a skill. And, and I, I know in the IB, they talk a lot about reflection um, and that's obviously a, a big focus. So you've clearly reflected on this and then felt like you've made the right choice. Can you just talk to me a little bit about, for the listeners out there, the importance of the, the skill of reflection, because clearly you've reflected on your journey and you've gone, yeah, I had some highs, I had some lows. I went this way, I went that way. Yeah, there was times when I was upset, there was times when I was down, but I've reflected on that and gone, no, actually, I've ended up in the right place. So just explain a little bit to us, if you don't mind, the importance of reflection, either in your life or sort of in, in general. I think I started to notice it maybe um, three years into my teaching career. 
every Tuesday, Thursday, I would have really busy teaching timetables. Um, but then I would go straight to gymnastics and I'd coach till seven. So those long days on paper, you'd look at it and go, oh, those days you're going to come home the most tired or like, you know, just worn out from two 12 hour days. And I started to notice that actually the days that I would finish earlier, I felt like something was missing. I felt a bit drained, like I hadn't lived my passion as much, I guess. I, I, it's not that I didn't enjoy teaching PE, I loved it. But after I came home from gymnastics coaching, you know, I'd get home late and I was just buzzing. And it's because the kids would fill me with energy, that the sport always fills me with energy. So I spent a lot of time reflecting. At first, you know, I was in my mid twenties. So I wasn't actually reflective at all. You know, you kind of just bounce around through life a little bit. And I'd, I'd say around 28, I started thinking more clearly about what I want, why I want it, how am I going to get there? What do I need to do? And just making sure that every, every day that I go to work, I don't have that kind of doubt anymore. Like I just, I want to make sure that I'm following my gut and I'm making a career that I, I'm excited to wake up for every single day and do. It kind of evolved a bit naturally, but I'm very happy with it. It's something that we as teachers, and again, obviously yourself as, as, a, as a teacher and a coach and stuff, you're always trying to teach that to the students, aren't you? You're trying to say, listen, reflection is really important. And this reflection is really important from a younger age. And as you've said yourself, you know, in your mid twenties, you're still reflecting as an adult and going, hang on a minute, I'm having to take a step back and am I doing the right thing? And, 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 you know, it, it's a really important skill and, and it's one that it's come up a lot over our conversations with different people, but with your conversation and your story, I think it's become really prevalent because you've spent a lot of time talking about decision-making and am I making the right choice? And, and obviously it's worked out brilliant for you because the end goal is you're now at a top school in the role of you, that you're passionate with. But what I'm really, really like about your journey so far is you've had to probably stop and have many reflections along the way and go, oh, hang on a minute, what am I doing here? And each time you have those reflections, you've said yourself, following my gut, you always come back into that feeling of, well, no, this, I'm still, I'm still not there yet. I still need to do something to get me where I want to be. And that's a real kind of selling point for your story that makes, makes it so interesting. I'm going to try to change tact a little bit, Rebecca, if, if that's okay. Um, I am a young, enthusiastic male or female listening to this podcast. I've listened to your story and I'm really excited about the fact that I'm talking, sorry, I'm listening to someone that's hugely passionate about gymnastics. I want to be you. I want to get to where you are. You've talked a little bit about you're doing your level one, you've done your level two. Um, just talk to me a little bit more about if I was a 14 or 15 year old listening to this and I've got a real passion to be a gymnastics coach, what qualifications or directions do you feel? And obviously there knows there's lots that you can go. Obviously yours is one way, there's other ways, but what kind of coaching qualifications or things do you think that I definitely need or I definitely should explore if I wanted to become a full-time gymnastics coach? For the listeners, I'd say go down to your local gym because any gymnastic coach would lap you up in a second. So if you are there wanting to volunteer and give time, absolutely, they will take you on board. I'd be very surprised if a coach turned an enthusiastic helper away because with gymnastics, you've got your coach to gymnast ratio for safety. So that's quite restrictive. And when you take part a skill into lots of micro skills, so if you take even the backward roll, a very basic skill, you might have six or seven stations that will break down that skill. So to have an extra set of hands and to correct basic technique, it's, you know, that if you're a volunteer, you can make a big difference to kids' development. And, and then I'd say to go down the traditional route. So I did my coaching with British Gymnastics and they are awesome. Um, I've done several courses with them and every time I've loved the course the course is very hands-on we've learned a lot yeah just see where the local course is in your area the website's very clear as well and super easy to use so you can always select what county you're in what level you want they've got very clear flow charts as well for those pathways um but yeah trying to get at least a, I guess a level one under your belt just so that you're cleared from a health and safety perspective but going back to that volunteer theme so yeah just turn up ask 
my dad was always a big um, advocate. I remember when I turned 13, uh, he was like, right, Bex, it's time to go get a job. And I was like, well, I don't really know who's hiring. So he just basically made me write down my skills on a piece of paper and made me walk around and hand them out. And he was like, you don't ask, you don't get. So that's kind of something that I guess has st stuck with me a lot and take that risk and ask. If someone says no, you're in the exact same position that you're in right now, but someone might say yes and it might change your life. And that's kind of, I guess, how I've fallen into opportunities as well. Like, like another love of mine has been academic side of education. Yeah, I can talk to you a little bit more about that. It's not as sporting specific, but that's the kind of passion which has kicked off in me the last four years and that came from me asking for funding for my master's asking to go on leadership courses and my school recognizing this new passion of mine and supporting it so yeah you don't ask you don't get <laughs> no I, I, I love that um so like yourself Rebecca I'm, I'm from the UK uh as is as is as is Gavin um but unlike Gavin I come from a northern family like yourself Rebecca and I think the if you don't ask you don't get is uh, a mantra up north um, because ultimately if you don't ask you don't get anything ever <laughs> but it, it's definitely a very very good mantra to have that one uh, moving forward in life because you're absolutely right if you don't ask the opportunity will pass you by um, if you don't ask people don't know you're interested I think that's the biggest one yeah. Um, and and like yourself you know I'm, I'm I, I've done the masters I've uh, which I, I very you know, graciously took funding for with my school. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've done, I think, over 30 different level ones and courses. But again, I've done it in random sports that, that I've, ne I've never actually gotten around to teach. And I had the opportunity to teach because, again, if you don't try it, you don't know. So I'm kind of evolving that mantra of if you don't ask, you don't get. I think as well as that is if you don't try, you don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's another one to to bring in as well. And um, um, move, move, moving forward, however, is we've heard about all this volunteering. Again, really important thing to highlight: the volunteering. We've heard about if you don't ask, you don't get. We've heard about if you don't show up or you don't try, you'll you'll never know. That's what's gotten you to where you are today. What I want to know is what's next. What's next for, for yourself? Where, where, where do you see yourself going now? So you've, you've attained one of the, the top positions in the world in your career or in your, in your, in your field. What's next? Where, where, where do you see, where's the next passion project? Where's the next uh, direction for yourself? A new passion that's kind of popped up and it kind of surprised me a little bit would be academia. I absolutely love, like I, I love studying and I love research. So I'm toying with the idea of maybe going into this direction. And I've been thinking a lot about my love for teaching and academia. And I think it, I'm not ready yet. I'm still young and able, but gymnastics coaching and PE teaching is like, it's hard on the body. Um, I know I can't do it forever, or like, especially not gymnastics coaching. You know, you're always lifting and throwing kids so um i i would love i think to be a pgc lecturer i would love to be able to teach teachers how to teach or aspiring teachers how to teach and, and kind of go into academic research behind teaching i'm very passionate about gender that's kind of my focus point social justice issues in education as well have been a big focus point for me throughout my master's and yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about that. So potentially I'm toying with the idea of maybe doing uh, further education again. Um, but I'm not going to say it for sure and commit myself, but it's definitely on my mind. Um, but for now, I'm just absolutely loving my job here at Patina. You know, I, it's an incredible school. I love all the, the stuff that I get to do. Um, I've done a few leadership courses as well. So I'm, I'm really uh, enjoying my leadership journey at the moment, which I get to do uh, at Passano in my department and stuff. So yeah, there's a few different avenues that I'm eyeing up, but for now I'm very happy where I am. So. 
And again, congratulations to you, Rebecca. You've, you've had an amazing journey and, and to, to be where you are. Yes, I wouldn't move for a while. Um, but if, you, if your body can still throw kids, as you say it, then, then, then keep throwing kids. <laughs> um, I do like the fact that you know, you've, you've raised the idea of, of social justice. Um, I think that's very important for anyone listening. That's a, that's a really, really big thing in our industry at the moment in time, social justice, especially looking at it from an international perspective. Um, and anyone listening, uh, and I'm sure um, you'll agree, that there's a big movement in PE at the moment, uh, especially down the con concept curriculum route. Um, the concept curriculum 2.0 was recently released uh, by Lee Sullivan and the rest of the team at PE Scholar. And you've got many other people like Phil Mathy who are real advocates of this, uh, of this movement. So anyone listening, just while we're on the topic, I recommend uh, looking into concept curriculums uh, and, and how social justice forms a big part of that. Um, just while we've got you, Rebecca, um, are, you, are, you, are you in any way involved in the concept curriculum at the moment? Because from what I understand, Bangkok Patna are, are very much looking at concept curricula as, as the future of PE. Yeah, actually next week I am meeting with secondary PE and we're going to um, start creating a new gymnastics curriculum. Um, I know for the head of PE here I actually used to work with my old head of department in Qatar um, and at an IB school. So I know we had Lee Sullivan actually join us for a CPL um, at Bangkok Patana and he was talking about the concept curriculum and for me being part of the British system and also teaching IBPE, you know, they've taken the best of both, I feel, um, because I, I don't think the British or the IB is perfect in any way, but they've kind of met in the middle and I really like when, what they've done with it. Um, but yeah, we, we are always looking to further improve and develop um, PE partner and I know the head of PE here is very passionate about um, doing the same, you know, going towards that concept-based curriculum. No, thank you for that very much, Rebecca. So um, I'm sure we could sit here and talk to you for absolute hours uh, and hours and hours about the, your passion for this industry and where we see it going. Uh, but we're focusing more on yourself and your own personal journey right now. And that leads us on to some of our little fun questions we like to ask all of our guests uh, at the end of the show. So my little fun question that I like to ask... All of, my, all of our guests is based around other possibilities. Um, so my question is, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, if you weren't in gymnastics, let's, let's say if you weren't in gymnastics or you weren't in, in, in teaching, what else do you think you, you might have found yourself doing? Uh, honestly, it's hard to think about that. I, I was so headstrong as a kid that I wanted to be a teacher. I kind of closed my eyes. I had like blinkers on and maybe design in some way. I always find myself drawn towards the design shows in Netflix, like interior design or architecture or something. I love those shows. But yeah, I'm just really happy being a teacher. I, I don't I don't really know. <laughs> That's good. It's, it's a tough question, isn't it? When someone puts you on the spot, you're like, oh, I don't really know. And like you spend a lot of time talking about your passion and you you're one of those in life that's got to your passion, which, which is great. Um, my question is, uh, you've given a few today, actually, but I don't know if this is the one or if there's another one. Or, um, But what is your mantra? What's your what's your phrase or sentence or something that you, you'd say you live your life by? Um, yeah, I mentioned a couple. Like, if you don't ask, you don't get. That's always stuck with me from my dad. And, um, you know, if you love what... If, if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. My dad always said that too. So I don't feel like I get up and go to work. Like there's no nine till five, like the oh, feeling for me, it's it's like, it's, it's exciting to get up and go to work every day because I've worked to forge a career in that passion. And then I, yeah, I guess a serious one that um, I heard actually a couple of years ago when I was first studying social justice. And I think it's, it's important for people to kind of, Think about, I guess it would be um, privilege is invisible to those who have it. And that's something that I try to think about every day. And I think for leaders as well and leaders in sport, um, especially with the kind of journey that, uh, that gen the, the topic of gender in sport, I think uh, that's, it's a really important thing for people to think about. Um, so for me, I always reflect if somebody from like, if 
for instance, for you, if you um, have a female in your team and a female comes to you and, and says something that might not be obvious for you, it, you know, you're privileged in a way that someone else might not be, so it's not clear. And I, that was really powerful when I heard it. I was like, okay, it gave me a different perspective when someone highlights something which I don't see, maybe it's because I'm in a privileged position. So yeah, I think that's a good one to live by too. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rebecca. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your time today. It's been a, a real pleasure to kind of listen to you. I think there's a, a few key takeaways there, but the one I think I'm just going to say over and over again is volunteer, 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 because that seemed to be a, a pattern that came up. And, and then obviously because of your passion and enthusiasm and you were then putting yourself out there for everyone to see that by volunteering, you then given yourself an opportunity to, 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 to be successful. Of course, there's hard work and commitment and effort, which I'm not, not taking away from you, of course, but uh, definitely one of the things I think I've taken away from your you know, story is you, you've really spent a lot of time talking about that. And actually, it's a very, very key point where you've gone off and you've still done your studying and you've still done your coaching, but you've been so passionate and you've been so keen to volunteer that you've then given yourself the platform, as you said, to showcase what your talents are. So um, again, a huge thank you from me, Rebecca, and thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sharing your story. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, again, thank you ever so much from the Sporting Directions team. Um, as with all of our guests, we've learned so much from you and I hope our listeners have, heard, uh, have learned something new and uh, go out and uh, fill that hole inside of them and follow their passion. So again, Thank you ever so much.